Yeah, if you want to get rid of it, I'll take it down. Anybody missing a handout from the last one? Okay, so we're at lecture three. We're going to continue on. We hope. With water and move into organic compounds today. Okay, so lecture three, we'll do our five minutes somewhere around 11.50. Both books that I mentioned, the Atlas of Bovine Anatomy and um, Anatomy and Physiology of Farm Animals are at the reserve desk. Does everybody know where that is? So if you need it, want to use those books, they are available to you. First written assignment would be due Thursday. The class has agreed to hard copy, so we'll see how that works. First review session will be after class on Thursday. So last time. So last time we talked about a pH of a solution. The pH, the measurement of pH, the one through 14 numbers is a shorthand for measuring the concentration of hydrogen ions. And as we step through the pH numbers, as we go from one to two, three to four, four to five, each time we move those numbers, we change the concentration or the amount of hydrogen ions in solution by a tenfold amount. So instead of writing out that 10 to the minus seven, we just say seven. So if we think about it that way, we have 
Lemon juice, they're suggesting it's pH 2. I think that might be a little strong, but for the sake of an example, pH 2 has 10 times more hydrogen ions than grapefruit juice at pH 3, which has lemon juice versus tomato juice. There's a hundredfold difference. We're going from four or four to two. So we're going to get a hundred times. And then if we compare lemon juice to pure water, there'll be a hundred thousand times more ions, hydrogen ions in that solution compared to pure water. So I think you have this from last time in your handouts. So how much graphically are hydrogen ions present? How much are the hydroxyl groups present? An acetic acid or acidic solution, the hydrogen ions far outnumber the hydroxyl ions. So there's a lot of those hydrogen ions floating out there around. We flip that around as we go to the other end of the scale. We're down in the basic section where the hydrogen ions outnumber the hydroxyl ions outnumber the hydro hydrogen ions. So we're balanced at neutral or near pH 7. That is our neutral solution where those two elements of water, those two parts of water are balanced in their dissociation. As we move up, we increase the proportion of hydrogen ions. As we move down, we increase the proportion of hydroxyl ions. So lemon juice, gastric juice, stomach, we think about pH 2, tomato juice 4, urine, for us, it's probably about six. For cows on pasture, it's usually about eight. When we're playing with decad, we try to bring that down to somewhere in the sixes to put an acid load on the cow. Blood is usually a little bit higher than pH seven neutral, <coughs> 7.4. Seawater, a little bit more basic. And then we work into the things that we're using to clean around the house. Ammonia, bleach, oven cleaner are the more basic 12, 13, and 14. So when we're looking at our pH, we said there's a concentration there. So that's the measurement of the number of moles present. So we said one mole is six times 10 to the 23rd. If we're doing one thousandth of that, we're gonna have 10 to the 20th ions. Hydrogen, free hydrogen ions and a pH three. Neutral, or somewhere around 10 to the 16th ions out of that mole, out of Avogadro's number. And as we move down to pH 11, we've got 11 decimal places here. We've almost cut in half, or well, it's not half, half of the exponent, but almost a billion times less hydrogen ions in that solution. So pH is a measurement of the mole, molar concentration. And from that molar concentration, we can extrapolate the number of ions that are present. Any questions about pH? The other thing we'll talk about is water as a solvent. Water is called the universal solvent 
because given enough time, it'll dissolve anything. So some things are not nearly as solvent friendly, but water seems to allow most things to dissolve in it over time. So certainly the electrolytes dissolve very, very quickly. Oil will have a limited amount that's dissolved there. Things like gold and metal and things will dissolve and go into solution over time. Using this property, we're going to go into something called osmolality. O-S-M-O-L-A-L-I-T-Y. Osmolality or osmolarity, uh, either one of those in class, um, is the measurement of dissolved particles in a solution. So what is present in that solvent of water and how much is there? We measure that again on a molar basis. So molar, a moles is kind of a root word in there. So has anybody ever heard of osmolality before? I'm guessing not. But you've dealt with it along the way. So we're measuring the amount of moles of an element in solution. So if we put one mole in there and half of it dissolves, the osmolality is 0.5. The rest stays at the bottom. So we've already mentioned grams is equal to the atomic weight, 18 grams per mole of water, 58.5 grams per mole of table salt. Every mole has the same number of atoms, just those atoms or molecules are gonna weigh differently. Water, relatively light. Sodium and chloride together, relatively heavy. So technically, there's two different ways to express the amount of solute dissolved in a solution. One is osmolality, and that's the stuff dissolved in a kilogram of water. That's usually what's used in labs and stuff because it's easier to measure the weight than it is to measure the volume. Osmolarity is the moles in one liter of water. I'm not sure who came up with these two um, words, but it would be a whole lot easier if osmolality was the liter one. But they're switched. So osmolality kilograms, for the purpose of this course, they are interchangeable. I don't care which phrase you use, which you use the R or the L, I don't care. If you're going on to advanced chemistry, yes, it'll make a difference. Why are these interchangeable? Does anybody get that difference? Because a liter of water is roughly a thousand grams or a kilogram. Now, depending on the temperature, that liter of water, that kilogram of water will be more or less than a liter. So they're not exactly interchangeable, but we're talking about small percentage differences. So in this class, they're interchangeable. So where do we deal with osmolality? Well, the thing we should be dealing with or should have checked probably two months ago is your antifreeze. Everybody check to make sure their antifreeze goes to minus 20 around here. We had that day last week where we had minus 25. 
what we put in there, propylene glycol, is the amount of stuff in that water. The more stuff you have in that water, the lower the freezing point drops. We do the same thing with salt on ice. Salt on day like today will actually work. I increase the amount of stuff in solution, the moles of something in solution, it will depress the freezing point. So we deal with that. Anybody here wear contacts? Yes. You just bring the contact? Okay, sorry. Contact solution. Does anybody know what that has to be? Or else it'll hurt like hell. Does anybody ever put contacts in with pure water? It's got to hurt. We have an iso osmotic solution. We have a concentration of solute that equals what we normally have in the body. And because that those two things are equal, water does not shift back and forth. So that's a good thing. Hypertonic saline. Has anybody ever give that to a cow? Anybody? Uh, you, if somebody had, what's the first thing that happens? You give that hypertonic bottle of saline. We do that to treat cows usually with a toxic mastitis. We're trying to get them to flush their body out. We put a whole lot of sodium and chloride into their blood that increases the sodium and chloride concentration in the blood that passes through the brain. And there's a part there that says, you got a lot of sodium in here, you need to drink. If you ever give a cow a bottle of hypertonic saline, you have to have a five gallon bucket right there. Usually by the time you get the needle out from the IV, she will have consumed that five gallons. The idea is we use that. She's trying to get her osmotic, osmolality back in line by drinking water. And then the water flushes through her body and takes all the toxins out. Water in milk. Has anybody here looked at the uh, lab results of a milk sample turned in at your co-op? You get what? Fat, protein, MUNs, um, somatic cell, bacteria counts, all that. You get also lactose. Has anybody seen that column? That column really never varies unless you dump a whole lot of water into it, the milk, and then that's how they catch it. The amount of solute in milk, in this case lactose, is constant. Lactose draws the water from the body at a constant rate, so there's always a about 4.74, 4.75% lactose in the milk because that's a constant draw. Trying to make milk more or less isotonic, isoosmotic. So we've dealt with osmolarity in a couple different phases. So what terms are we gonna use here to define if we're dealing with stuff in solution? The first thing we're going to deal with is the solution. Now, in a lab, that solution could be anything that's liquid. But when we're dealing with the body, our solution is water. And that's why you see them going to uh, planets and stuff. They're looking for liquid water because they feel that might be necessary for any sort of life to have water present. But there may be a different way of looking at that. You have the solution and you have the solute. The solute is whatever goes into solution. So in the body, that could be the electrolytes, sodium, potassium, chloride. That makes up a lot of it. You have proteins, will have osmotic activity. 
you have bicarb that will have osmotic activity. And we manage those elements to keep our blood at a constant osmolality. Equilibrium. If you have a container with solute in it and water in it, and there's no restrictions to movement, over time, that solution will equilibrate. So every spot in that container will have the same amount of solute as every other. So everything's driving to equilibrium. When we're dealing with osmolality and equilibrium in the body, we have to bring up the concept of semi-permeable membrane. And by definition, that membrane allows certain stuff through. Usually water goes through that membrane in the body pretty easily, but it restricts other stuff. Usually the solid or solutes. So electrolytes don't necessarily pass through those membranes without permission. In the body, that membrane is the lipid bilayer. Does anybody remember that from biology somewhere along the line? That the outside of a cell, animal cell, it's the plasma membrane. It's constructed, and we'll talk more about that. The lipid bilayer. You have two layers of fat that are opposing each other that form that outside layer. And then if you have on one side of the membrane a different concentration of solute than you do on another side of a membrane, there is a drive or a want that everything wants to go to equilibrium. The concentrations of water, the concentrations of solute want to be equal. If there is a difference, I can apply a force, and we'll illustrate this in a minute or two, a force that may stop that push to equilibrium. So the greater the difference, the stronger the drive to equilibrium, the greater the osmotic pressure I have to apply to stop that equilibrium process. Any questions on the definitions? Everybody got the part so far. So osmolality, the movement of solute and solution toward equilibrium. See if I can do this without making too much of a mess. So I have in this container, powder, um, Gatorade, I forget what type, the blue stuff, that's all I call it. So whatever's available, that's the powder, that's our solute. And then in this container, we have our solution, which we hope is reasonably pure water. If I put them together, work as well as it could have. If we look at the bottom, we still have a lot of solid left down there. So we have a different concentration of solid at the bottom, or solute, than we do at the top. But over time, it wants to equilibrate. If I left this right here for the entire semester, what do you think is going to happen? It's probably going to rot and turn moldy and all that disgusting stuff first. But if I can get it purified, uh, sterilized, 
that solid on the bottom would work its way up through the liquid. And by the end of the semester, we'd probably have a uniform concentration of water and solute top to bottom. Well, I probably don't want to wait that long to drink it. Has anybody ever dealt with Gatorade powder? And you, if you under mix it, it tastes really bad. So I probably, so what I'm going to do is add energy to the mix. So we got stuff, stuff on the bottom. We need to move it in solution. I'm adding energy that's going to make that mix uniform. So I've added energy. Does anybody, has anybody heard of Brownian motion? Brownian motion is the movement of molecules. They sit in place and vibrate. As I add more heat to a system, they vibrate more and more and more. That's what drives the equilibrium is the motion of the individual atoms, the water molecules, the sugar and electrolyte molecules as they move they bounce and eventually will distribute evenly throughout a solution if i add water by energy by shaking it i speed up that process if i add heat i increase the brownian motion it moves to equilibrium faster but there is enough heat in here that over a semester that will um get a uniform solution, but I probably don't want to wait that long to drink that particular thing. So osmosis is the movement of solute and sol uh, solution toward equilibrium. We're trying to make things equal in all spots and trying to make things equal on both sides of a membrane. That's what the natural chemistry, the natural physical properties want to do. And one of the key points that we're going to make in this class is that in the body, water follows solute. The body pretty much manages the solutes. It moves them from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane moves it from this part of the kidney to that part of the kidney, moves the lactose from inside the udder to the lumen outside the udder. The body manages the solute. And then water will follow it. So wherever that solute goes, you've got water chasing after it, trying to make everything balanced. So the body takes energy, takes um, effort to move solutes around and get them in the right place. And then the water follows passively. So this is a key point. We're dealing with bodily processes. So, ready to test things up just a little bit. We have our cheer. Water follows solute, water follows solute, rah, rah, rah. I didn't use all that stuff in high school or college, but you ready to give it a try? Water follows solute, water follows solute, rah, rah, rah. Can you try it? I want you, I want to drill this into your head. Ready? One, two, three. Waterfall site, waterfall site. You're leaving me hanging. <laughs> this is not a TikTok video. This is in your education. You gonna try it one more time? Or are you gonna leave me hanging? I just need to know one way or the other. We can use this awkward pause as a learning moment. Everybody see where we're going with this? So, what does this mean? The body expends effort, energy, to make sure the solutes aren't in the right location. Has anybody ever heard of the sodium-potassium ATPase pump? 
Is that anywhere in your brain? That uses pumping sodium out, out of the cell, pumping potassium in the cell, uses about 25% of the energy we consume every day. Pumping those things into a non-equilibrium state. If a cow creates lactose in her udder, puts it into the alveolus. Does everybody know what the alveolus is in the, the milk, the udder? That's technically outside the body. You have secretory tissue. You have this bulb, millions of them, very tiny. You have secretory tissue, secretory cells that line this sphere. They create the lactose. They secrete the lactose into the lumen or the open area in that bulb. Lactose is a solute, water follows passively into there. Then once you've got the water in there, everything flows down to the teats and we harvest it as milk. The body moves the solute, lactose, water follows passively. So no energy, no effort to move water. There's only two places where it doesn't happen in the body. Everywhere else, water follows the solute, and we'll get to those. So why is this important? If we're dealing with swelling and edema, we have a local increase in solute outside the cell. In order to balance everything out, to reach equilibrium, to be everything isoosmotic, more water's got to move outside those cells. And when we do that, we get swelling or edema outside the cells, outside the blood vessels, and that can be a challenge to get rid of as you move forward. Kidney function. The kidney is all about moving things from one set of vessels to another, moving sugar, amino acids, um, vitamins, minerals, all the electrolytes, all of the uh, calcium, magnesium. It actively moves those. Water follows that passively except for one spot, and we'll talk about that when we get kidney. Mastitis. You have that swelling, that white blood cells working in an area, they're destroying bacteria, which releases the contents of that bacteria. The contents of that bacteria are solutes. Water comes rushing to that area, trying to balance things out. The ruminal lining, very much trying to ma maintain or make sure that everything's where it's supposed to be. The ruminal lining is one of the places where water does not follow solute. And we'll talk about that when we get to body water. Milk secretion we mentioned already. Equilibrium. Everything moves from a high concentration to a low concentration. Think about it like skiing or snowboarding. Very easy to go from a high spot to a low spot. Going back the other way is not going to work so much. We need a certain amount of Brownian motion to make that happen, especially for controlling the solutes. We may need ATP to move things around. Everything is going toward equilibrium. What happens if we do achieve equilibrium in the body? Anybody know? We're dead. Our bodies are constantly fighting equilibrium, putting things in different locations. If we let that system break down, if all the membranes break down and we would achieve equilibrium with our environment, we are dead. 
So we've talked about pH, osmolality. Any questions on osmolality? So when we're thinking about this, we've got solute on one side of a semi-permeable membrane and water, pure water on the other side. So this is a U-shaped container. You've got a tube going up, coming down across, going back up with a semi-permeable membrane between that. So the semi-permeable membrane allows water to move, but not the solute. So what's the only way we can achieve equilibrium in that situation? We probably can't, but in order for it to try to happen, water is going to try to move over here. Water is on a high concentration here. A lower concentration here, diluted out with solute, it's going to move from a high to a low. The solute itself can't move. So the water can cross, but the solute can't. The water is going to try to continue to move over into this side to dilute out the solute to make things equal. Until we get a column of water there that it's just too much weight, too much pressure to keep going in that direction. So with that gravity at some point is going to stop the balance. If we lay this on its side where gravity is no longer a factor, Theoretically, all the water would move over onto that other side. But eventually, we're going to get a weight of water that's going to counteract that flow, or at least most of it, keep pushing it back across that membrane. You're going to get a little bit of difference, and then at some point, gravity is going to be too great for additional water to move in. That's what we're talking about with osmotic pressure. We do the same thing where we've got pure water outside a tube with a semi-permeable membrane on the end of it. And inside that tube's a whole lot of solute. The water's going to try to equal things out. The solute can't move. It's going to start to lift up that column of water. That's different from capillary action. Both things will help that. To counteract the water coming in, I have to exert a pressure down that tube. And that pressure would be equal to the osmotic pressure. The drive toward equilibrium is going to create a pressure. To counteract that, I have something equal to my osmotic pressure. So water can cross that yellow semi-permeable membrane. The solute cannot. So we don't usually find situations like this in our body, but we may have some artificial situations. So. If we're thinking about the concentration of solutes in the body, most of the fluids we're dealing with are either isotonic or isoosmotic. So we have a certain amount of solute, it's like saline solution for your eyes, or saline solution that we might try to hydrate a calf with or a sick cow with, there is an osmotic solution. So that isoosmotic refers to the con normal concentration of solute in blood. And when we're doing that, we see 0.3 osmoles, the so one third of 30% of a mole. 
in a liter of water, a kilogram of water, or if we do our milli, we move that decimal point three places, we have 300 milli osmoles, and that's about what you're gonna see for most isotonic solutions. 290, 300, 310 is considered isotonic or isoosmotic. So tonicity and osmolality are equivalent or synonyms. So if the zombie apocalypse comes and you need to treat some sort of injury or create a saline solution, you're going to need nine grams of sodium chloride table salt per liter of water. Not a lot to create an osmotic solution, isoosmotic, or a saline solution to help people out. You see the movie Mountain Between Us? I was kind of bizarre. The doctor in the movie made uh, isotonic solution in a cabin with no real supplies or anything like that. So I lost kind of, well, there was a lot of things to disbelieve in that movie. That was one of them. Now, relative to blood, we can go more solute in the solution or less solute in the solution. We can think about hypertonic or hyperosmotic. Hyper meaning above. So we're going to have, in this case, you're going to have something greater than the isotonic amount. That could be a small difference. Or if you're dealing with that uh, saline solution that we're giving to a cow, you might have something that might be two to three times higher than that. Might even be more than that. So a lot of solute, a lot of electrolytes. I'm guessing this here is more than isotonic, hypertonic. So more solute than isotonic, therefore less water than isotonic. In a given volume, in a given weight. The other side of that, we have isotonic. If we take solute out of that solution, we're going to have something that is hypo, hypo meaning less or under. So hypotonic or hypoosmotic is going to be something that has less than 0.3 milliosmoles, 0.3 osmoles or 0.3. 300 milliard volts. So if I keep taking that solute out, what do I eventually get? I eventually get pure water, right? I remove solute. So the ultimate hypotonic or hypoosmotic solution is water. Nothing in it. So less solute than an isotonic solution, but more water on a concentration basis. So the drive to equilibrium, we have Hypoosmotic solution here, very little solute in it. This might be isotonic, we don't know. Has anybody heard the fastest way to hydrate is to drink pure water? Anybody heard that? So that's because the water in your gut is hypoosmotic, high concentration of water, it's going to move into your body faster the differential between the two. So we need to think about placing, and the reason we have saline is we try to 
be nice to the blood when we're injecting things into the body. So we're going to place a cell into a solution, and then we're going to figure out what happens to it. So I think you have this diagram. Yeah, you got that in the lower right last time. So I've taken parts of it out. We're going to focus. You've got a cell, two cells in a hypotonic solution. You've got two cells in a isotonic solution. I forget what order they're in here. Hypo on the other side. So we're looking up red blood cell, then we have a plant cell, and then we have the cell wall around the outside. The cell wall is that, for those of you who took um, nutrition, that NDF cell wall, a rigid structure. Whereas our animal cell, our red blood cell at the top does not have that. So if we're looking at the inside of the cell, we'll call that the B, the concentration of solute and water, respectively inside the cell versus outside the cell. In a hypo or a isotonic or isoosmotic solution, what are the concentrations? Outside the A versus the inside the B's. By definition, they are equal. So isotonic, you have the same amount of solute outside the cell as you have inside the cell. So given the drive to equilibrium, if water happens to come inside the cell, then you have a temporary, I've got water is now higher concentration inside the cell, equal things out, it's got to leave again. So things are, water is moving across the membrane, but because there's an equal amount of solute on either side, they stay equal. Water moves in, you have a temporary shift, in the amounts or concentrations, that water or different water leaving will balance things out again. So nothing really changes. The water will move in, move out, but the concentrations on both sides stay the same. If I place these two cells in a hyper or hypotonic solution, so what would this outside blue area be in this situation? Hypotonic, ultimate hypotonic solution is water. So let's take these two things and stick them in water. What do we know about the concentration of the inside of the cells, the B areas versus the A areas. What's where's the solute highest? Inside. Where is the water highest? Outside. So everything wants to move from a high to low, but we've got a semi-permeable membrane there. So what do the solute do? It doesn't move. It can't get out. It would like to move from a high to a low, but at least initially it can't move out across that membrane. Where's the concentration of water the highest? Outside the cell, especially if you think of water hypotonic. So where does that water want to go? It wants to go from a high to a low, so where does it go? goes inside, just like we saw in that U thing. Goes inside, trying to balance things out. But as long as there's only solute on the inside and not the outside, 
water will continue to flow into that red blood cell until it bursts. <clears throat> this is why we can't give you an IV of straight water or you'll blow up all your red blood cells. Has anybody ever done that under a slide? You're looking at red blood cells under a slide. You accidentally put water on it and not um, a saline solution. All you get is this pink layer of stuff. Everything bursts. So you can only hold so much back. What's the plant cell doing? The membrane is pushing up against that cell wall around the outside of the plant cell. And that's preventing that plant cell from exploding. It's pushing back. It's creating a force equal to the osmotic pressure. And you think about plants out in the world. This is probably one of the reasons they have cell walls. They get pure water on them. They take it in that way. It helps them survive a little bit longer. Is everybody seeing hypotonic? Hypertonic, so what are we dealing with now inside versus outside? What do we know about where the high water concentration is? Where's the highest water concentration? Inside the cell. Outside, we have more solute on the outside. So the water concentration is higher in the cell, either one of them, than outside. The solute concentration is higher outside the cells than inside the cells. So what's going to happen? Where's the solute going to go? Nowhere. It's got, can't go across the membrane. Water can move, so it goes from a high concentration to a low concentration and therefore flows out of the cell. So in both cases, you have both of those shriveling up as the water leaves the cell. So we put something in a hypertonic solution, it's gonna shrink down. Eventually enough water will leave that you will destroy the working operations of the cell. Everybody understand or follow the logic of all three of those situations. Where is the solute higher? Where is the solute lower? Where is the water higher in concentration? Where is the water lower in concentration? And how everything moves So you can't move. Eventually, in this case, we have rupture, and then over time, the solute will equilibrate going through the solution, but you've achieved equilibrium, you've also achieved death. So making sure we get that osmolality, making sure We've got a saline solution when we're dealing with the body so we don't rupture those blood cells. We put straight water in. We will run into a situation where we rupture all our blood vessels or blood cells and things don't work as well. You've got hypertonic. You're trying to get those animals to drink more water to flush things out of their body, taking advantage of we mess up the isotonic in the short run. The cow will respond very quickly to try to reach that back. You expand the water volume of the cow. Cow says, I don't need that much, and then flushes everything out, hopefully along with the toxins. toxins. Other properties, surface tension, Adhesion and cohesion of water will pick up as we go. So these have to do with water being sticky and that hydrogen bond, the positive to negative 
we'll show you where that's important as the semester goes on. Any questions on any of that? Take your break. We'll start again at 12 o'clock.
Okay, um, you should have a handout that shows this table somewhere. We'll come back to it over and over again as we get through this next week and a half. If we're looking at our compounds or molecules, we've got different things we're going to look at. We're, we finished up water. We're going to look at hot hydrocarbons. And then hopefully over the next two lectures, get through carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So what do we have across the top? What is that? Big four, right? So if we're looking at the big four present in the body, where do we find those elements in the body? So the first thing we're going to have is water. We've talked about that. That's going to be made of oxygen and hydrogen. This is one of the reasons that oxygen is so prevalent if you break down what's in the body, water is that dominant molecule, probably more of those than anything else. So every uh, water molecule has got an oxygen. So you've got a lot of oxygen there. So hydrocarbons are next up. We think about organic compounds. So if we're thinking about organic compounds, we're thinking about things scientifically. Does anybody know what that means? If something is organic or we're studying organic chemistry, what are we studying? Any molecules or compounds that have carbon in them. So the fun argument to have is, well, organic is better for you. Well, technically organic, cyanide is organic. It's got a carbon molecule in it. So that's using organic in two different ways. We're going to use it in organic in this class to mean that carbon is present. The neat thing about carbon is it can make four bonds. So if we look at this as a carbon atom, there's an opportunity with that atom to make four different connections. There are a lot of elements of the periodic table that are very much, I like electrons, I'm gonna take as many as I can. There are other things like, eh, I don't really like electrons. Carbon sits in the middle. It's like, I can take them, leave them, don't really care, but that sharing of electrons is what forms a bond. So carbon can form four bonds. So looking at the big four, we have four bonds or connections. Hydrogen can only do one. Oxygen can do three and nitrogen, or oxygen can do two, nitrogen can do three. So the ability to do four different connections allows a lot of different things to happen. So that's pretty much the basis of life. The ability to make four different connections by a carbon atom. So carbon, four bonds, very versatile. All molecules or compounds, they're made by an animal or plant cells, will have carbon in them. Except for maybe water, but I don't know if you really call making that by an animal or not. So carbon is the basis of life. One of the things that the Mars rover is looking for has carbon been put into organic molecules. So if you end up taking organic chemistry for whatever reason, you're going to find that life is one big carbon skeleton. And the balance of carbon in the planet is a subject of debate. Is there too much free carbon running around? 
or doesn't that really matter? So people are sorting through that. If we're doing carbon, the simplest molecules we can make are just hydrogen and carbon atoms put together. So only two elements combined in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Does anybody know what those things might be called? Hydrocarbons. So we put those together. These are the basic building blocks, the backbone, if you will, of all compounds in the body. What we add to those hydrocarbons determines what the characteristic, what the chemical properties are, what the reactivity is of that hydro hydrocarbon. So they're very simple organic compounds. Two elements, hydrogen and carbon put together. They have no charge to them. The hydrogens and the carbons all share electrons equally. They're not pulling them in one direction or another, so you don't get that polarity that you do in water. Oxygen loves those electrons. It's going to make that oxygen a little bit more negative. Carbons, eh, I can take them or leave them. Use them, not use them. So there's no charge with those. They can give or take those electrons. So the classic example of hydrocarbons most people use every day or what? Where do we find car hydrocarbons? Fossil fuels are the simplest form. So we have the natural gas, which is one carbon, maybe two. As we get a couple more, we get gasoline, a liquid. As we get more and more carbons in the chain, we get thicker and thicker things that we make roads out of. So the simplest organic molecule is methane. One carbon with four hydrogens stuck to it. Since hydrogen can only make one connection, that's pretty much terminal. You can't add anything more than that. So methane, one carbon atom, four hydrogens. If we were write that, writing that out as a chemical formula, we say C, C is for the carbon, H is for the hydrogen, and there are four of them present, present so we do a subscript four. So that's the chemical formula of methane. We can draw them a number of different ways, and you should have this, I think, in today's handout. We can have kind of the structural formula that if we look at this, this way, flatten it out, you have the carbon in the middle and you've got the hydrogens going in four different directions. We do the ball and stick model, that's sort of what we've done here, if we think of these as hydrogen atoms on the end, or you've got the space filling molecule where you have the big bulbs associated with each of the atoms to show that configuration. So tetrahedron with hydrogens at the points, carbon in the middle. As we add carbons to the system, we get more and more complexity. That's pretty much all we can do with ethane, propane. That's pretty much the only configuration we can come up with that, three carbons. We get to butane, four carbons, we can do different arrangements. We can have everything in a straight chain going across, or we can have kind of a branch structure. We can have different amounts of double bonds in there, 
all based on four carbons, we can do more and more arrangements of those. So the more carbons we have, the more complex we can make those molecules, the more arrangements that we can do. So hydrocarbons, if we look at our big four chart, We've got hydrogen and carbon in those. So organic compounds in the body, we start with a hydrocarbon and then we add stuff to it. What we add determines what that is. So organic compounds in the body are a functional group. Each of those has a different reactivity, a different purpose, stuck to a hydrocarbon. So we say functional groups are hydrophilic as a rule. They like water, they're usually charged. Those two things sort of go together. And we'll talk about four of those. Others exist, but in the body, we're really gonna talk about four different types. So compared to a hydrocarbon, we have the opposite property. Hydrocarbons don't like water, hydrophobic. They don't have a charge. The functional groups have a charge and therefore like water. So the Ones we're going to deal with in this class are the hydroxyl group, the carbonyl group, the carboxyl group, and the amino group. So these are the functional groups, and then this is the name of that piece that gets stuck on. So you should have a diagram there. Is that readable in the handout I gave you or is it too small? Oh, kind of readable. readable. I figure you guys are younger. You might be able to do it. I wasn't sure. I know I can't get too old. So we have those four groups in that diagram. And we'll go through them one at a time. First, we have the hydroxyl group. Oxygen represented by the O and a hydrogen represented by the H. They can go back and forth, doesn't really matter. We know that the oxygen is greedy for electrons, so that little functional group is going to have a polar element to it. These are called, when we stick them on a hydrocarbon, so we took ethane. We took the hydrogen off and put a hydroxyl group in there. We now have ethanol. That OH is characteristic of the alcohols. Methanol, ethanol, and so on, all. propanol. So we're gonna usually find this functional group in sugars in the body and water soluble vitamins or Bs and Cs. Next up is the carbonyl. So you've got the lines here representing the attachment between two molecules. So this carbon is going to form two bonds with the oxygen and then two other connections. If one of those happens to be a uh, hydrogen ion, it'll be an aldehyde. If they connect to two carbons, it's going to be a ketone. So ketosis, we'll come back to that later. Because there's an oxygen involved, there's a disproportional sharing of the electrons, and you're going to have a charge associated with that group. 
So the carbonyl is about the carbon atom forming two bonds or a double bond with the oxygen atom. So you're going to find those in sugars, formaldehyde. You're going to find ketones in the urine of an animal with ketosis. We don't generally like that. Next step up in complexity is carboxyl group. Instead of having a hydrogen or a carbon over here, we've added a hydroxyl group. So we've got a carbon making three different bonds here. This tends to form an acid group, something that's willing to donate its Hydrogen, so acetic acid, two carbons, with that carboxyl group on the end, will donate that hydrogen when we're making silage. So you're going to find those in the backbone of our amino acids, therefore in proteins. You're going to have some in vitamins. You're going to have, this is going to, to be on the end of every fatty acid. So fat, hydrocarbon, acid is that carboxyl group on the end. And then for something completely different, we have your amino group. You've got the nitrogen and two hydrogens stuck to it. That's an amine. You're going to find this in your amino acids. You're going to find it in urea. That amino group pretty much defines proteins. So in all these cases, the colored areas here are polar functional groups that are attached to a hydrocarbon. These functional groups give that compound its character. And we'll next time we'll show you what those things do. Any questions on that? So I'm out of time for today. We will talk about what functional groups do in next lecture. Yes. Um, do you have those slides online? Not yet, but I will. So, like, the notes, will I have it, like, will it be there in time for the homework? Yeah. I'll try to get them up there today for you since for your last lecture. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. No worries. No worries. Have a nice day. Yep.